thanks in part to the fashion show you just saw, Tete and the women of Kupahoka are now negotiating to design and create clothing for major retailers in Europe and Latin America. This extraordinary shawl is an example of the work they do. The idea of free enterprise is appealing, but it takes time. What do you do when you see starvation, poverty, and death gripping your nation? When people are literally dying on your doorstep? For Muhammad Yunus, the answer was simple. Start a bank and make loans to the very poor. No collateral required. It was and still is a revolutionary idea. And the company he founded, Grameen Bank, may be the single most important new financial institution the world has seen in decades. Oh, I will full live on. Baba. Say, I'll full live on. Say, I. Till it's actually a good He is a mythical figure in his home country of Bangladesh. And he is received with equal admiration by kings and queens, presidents and prime ministers around the world. He is the most unlikely of combinations, a revolutionary banker. A man who has loaned billions of dollars to millions of poor people, all of it without any collateral. <laughs> Muhammad Yunus believes that credit is a basic human right. More than half the population of the world do not qualify to take a loan from the existing financial institutions. So unless we can create that environment, people cannot get on with their uh, life. More than 25 years ago, Yunus started loaning poor people small amounts of money. He asked for interest, but he required no collateral. And they thought this is a miracle. They couldn't believe that anybody in the right mind will do something like that. And that happiness, that excitement, got me into it. I said, if you can do this kind of thing, which makes so many, so many people so happy, with such a small amount of money, why shouldn't you do more of it? Many people thought he was crazy, and many more in this male-dominated Muslim society were upset that Yunus wanted to loan money to women. The simplest reason is, if the mother is the income earner, children benefits right away. So this is one, the immediate attention to children, nutrition level increases, they get enrollment in the schools, and so on. And then women have longer vision. They wanted to get out of poverty much more intensively than men do. Men do it. It all began here in the mid-1970s, in the port city of Chittagong, Bangladesh. Muhammad Yunus was a professor at the university here, teaching, as he calls it, grand economic theories. But there was a problem. The country was gripped by one of the worst famines of modern times. You walk out of the classroom and you see people dying around you. He, he or she used to be a very healthy person. But because she cannot get a handful of rice, she's slowly sinking. Every day you are inching towards your death and you look very helpless. You don't know what to do. So you, you ask yourself, uh, what is this arrogance about the knowledge that you have if it is not of some use to a dying person? Disillusioned with the gap between his teaching and the reality of death on his doorstep, Yunus went to a nearby village to ask the poor what they needed. And finally, when the list was complete, there are 42 names on that list, and the total money Together, they needed was $27. And that was the shock of my life. 
He gave these poor people the $27 out of his own pocket, which they used to start small businesses such as preparing rice for market. He told them they could pay him back in small installments whenever they had the money. It seemed like such a good idea, he went to a bank to ask why they didn't loan money to poor people. He was bluntly told that without any collateral, loans were impossible. The whole principle of conventional banking is the more you have, the more you get. I said the logical thing would be less you have, the more attention you should get. And if you have nothing, you are the one who should get the highest priority. But the first loans were paid back, and a trust was established. So Yunus started his own bank and called it Grameen, after a local word meaning village. And he continued to challenge the system. He visited the people instead of requiring them to come to the bank. And he wanted to change a system which was set up for men only. His new rules turned the banking system upside down. When I was asked, uh, why did you do that? Why did you turn it around like this? I said, for a simple reason, because I saw the conventional banking standing on its head. So I turned it around so that it can stand on its feet. But getting women involved wasn't easy. Thousands of years of tradition stood in the way. Uh, when we first started uh, uh, and started giving loans to women, men reacted uh, very negatively. They didn't like it. They, uh, their first reaction was to, uh, they were being insulted deliberately. Uh, why should they give money to women? What does she know? Mostly Muslim, many of them Hindu, living in a very conservative society, women would run away as Yunus or one of his students from the university would approach them with an offer of money and trust. And if you uh, somehow catch one to talk to uh, the person, she'll be shy, she'll be looking down uh, and whispering, she'll be talking in a whispering voice. It's been a long, slow process of change, but today, 95% of Grameen's borrowers are women. At first, we didn't take the loans. People said many things about Grameen Bank, and we were afraid. We didn't take any money, but slowly our confidence grew, and we would go and see what the gentleman had to say. The gentleman said how this would improve our families. Slowly, we gathered courage and said, Sir, we want to get involved. With the money that I took from the bank, I go to the market and buy rice and work with it. I have no fear now. I had fear before, but not now. It's a, a mutual trust between the lender and the borrower which keeps us moving because otherwise we don't have any legal instrument to uh, kind of uh, scare them that uh, if you don't pay back we are going to take you to the court or something like that. There isn't any. And they find it convenient. We make it extremely convenient to pay back because we come to your place and you pay in tiny, tiny installments. All of this unconventional thinking might make Muhammad Yunus a radical, but he doesn't like to be labeled. Uh, whether I'll be called a radical or a conservative or a liberal or a fundamentalist, I don't know. Uh, and yet this mild-mannered man has written these words. I wanted to create some panic in this unjust system. I wanted to be a stick in the wheels that would finally stop this infernal machine. His brother, Jahangir, says Yunus was always different than other people. He has always something different in thinking. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't see a problem like a common person in Bangladesh. He has a different outlook, he has a different view. Uh, and and uh, he has a uh, terrible capacity to, uh, to develop a solution of a problem. Uh, so uh, it doesn't surprise me that uh, he came with a new idea in the banking sector.
small loans are used to start small businesses, such as mat weaving, or preparing rice or ban leaves for market. Once a loan has been repaid, larger loans can be taken, some of them for hundreds of dollars. My husband drives a baby taxi. It costs 250,000. I want to buy a rickshaw for 20 to 50,000 taka. From the beginning, the payback rate has been astonishing, more than 95%. But more important is something which can't easily be measured, the rise in self-esteem, which comes with the repayment of a loan. The transformation that takes place in that person is amazing. She starts looking at her, that I was nobody at the beginning of the period. Now I'm somebody. I can conquer the world if I want to. Grameen Bank has grown today into a huge bureaucracy, but one that works due to meticulous organization. More than 75,000 centers, such as this one, loan $1 million a day. The small experiment, which began in Chittagong in 1976 with Eunice and a few students, now looks like this. 500 staffers serving 176,000 members in the Chittagong area alone. Although it was established with the help of grants and loans from development organizations, Grameen Bank is now self-sustaining. And the microcredit movement it founded has been replicated throughout the world, in places as different as Vietnam and the United States. But along with the successes came the inevitable criticisms. After all, Eunice has challenged the very foundation of the international development and banking worlds. Interest rates are too high, the repayment rate has been overstated, and microcredit doesn't reach the poorest people. Eunice shrugs off the criticisms as being wrong and missing the point in general. I never... Uh sold it, I never presented it as the solution. Microcredit is the solution. Microcredit is a central uh, role to play, but it cannot solve all the problems. Uh, so I, I, the, my uh, suggestion is try everything. Don't give up on anything, but never forget microcredit. Eunice will counter a criticism with a demonstration possible solution rather than an argument. So to combat the latest charge that his microcredit system doesn't reach the poorest people, Eunice is experimenting with a new loan program for the poorest of the poor, beggars. Now that I have some money and I can do business, it's less of a hardship. I sell goods sometimes for 20 takas, sometimes for 30 takas. I have a lot of hardships, and I am a poor woman. I work as a servant and sometimes beg. With my loans, I bought some bamboos and have some money left. They saw our suffering and our sadness because there was a lot of it. I will keep on taking as many loans as I can, and I will keep on working as long as I have strength in my body. Eunice is loaning $20 each to thousands of beggars. But this time, not only will no collateral be required, there are no repayment plans either. Just like that first loan of $27 he made to a small group of women many years ago. Another grand experiment by a man used to taking risks. Salma, take a shove me at Taka, Asia, take a shove me at Taka. Then Bismillah, Bismillah, quite a lot. Near, it is Bujalayan. Come on, take us. 
Here in Bangladesh, microcredit has moved beyond simple loans to become an entire social revolution. And that was part of the original plan. When each meeting begins, all members must recite 16 disciplines, which include resolutions not just about hard work and responsibility, but about nutrition, education, sanitation, and justice. Nowhere is the success of social change more evident than in the changing roles men and women now play in this society. It's an amazingly satisfying thing that uh, when I come to a village and talk to the women who joined Grameen Bank 15 years, 20 years back, not only you see their faces and what they wear, how they live, and most of all, looking at the children, uh, the amazing children. Now they are in school, little kids in fifth grade, sixth grade, in colleges. Suddenly you become very optimistic. The success of the Grameen Bank, Yunus says, is not about him. It's about the mindset of anyone who is willing to believe in the possibilities of microcredit and the potential of the poor. There's nothing wrong with the seed of the poor people. They are as good as any other human being. This is something which has impact on everything else. It impacts on education, it impacts on health, it impacts on uh, empowerment of women, it impacts on children. Microcredit is just an excuse to open up the lid. And then the whole thing, the genie comes out of it. Every human being has that genie. So that's what the microcredit does, to take the lid off. By investing in beggars to prove his theory of human enterprise, Muhammad Yunus is taking an enormous risk. But social entrepreneurship is about great gambles, because that's what it takes to change the world. Risk is at the heart of enterprise. It's inextricably linked to the need of human spirit to excel. When the opportunity's there, and the person has a stake in the outcome, anything's possible. Still, spirit and drive are only part of what it takes to succeed. You also need knowledge, education, the intellectual tools to transform ideas into practice. In the next episode of The New Heroes, we watch as some amazing individuals struggle to lift people out of poverty through the power of knowledge. I'm Robert Redford. Thank you for watching. Meet the new heroes and find out more about how social entrepreneurs are changing the world. Visit us at pbs.org. In India, turning train platforms into schools. In Thailand, the battle against child prostitution. And in Egypt, one mother refuses to give up on forgotten children. The Power of Knowledge, next on The New Heroes. The New Heroes series is available on a two-part DVD set for $29.95 plus shipping and handling. The companion CD is also available for $14.99. To place an order, please call 1-800-440-2651.
Major funding for the new heroes was provided by the Skoll Foundation. Additional funding provided by Calvert. Calvert. Investments that make a difference. We are PBS. And the company he founded, Grameen Bank, may be the single most important new financial institution the world has seen in decades. He is a mythical figure in his home country of Bangladesh. And he is received with equal admiration by kings and queens, presidents and prime ministers around the world. He is the most unlikely of combinations, a revolutionary banker. A man who has loaned billions of dollars to millions of poor people, all of it without any collateral. <laughs> Muhammad Yunus believes that credit is a basic human right. More than half the population of the world do not qualify to take a loan from the existing financial institutions. So unless we can create that environment, people cannot get on with their uh, life. More than 25 years ago, Yunus started loaning poor people small amounts of money. He asked for interest, but he required no collateral. And they thought this is a miracle. It all began here in the mid-1970s, in the port city of Chittagong, Bangladesh. Muhammad Yunus was a professor at the university here, teaching, as he calls it, grand economic theories. But there was a problem. The country was gripped by one of the worst famines of modern times. You walk out of the classroom and you see people dying around you. He, he or she used to be a very healthy person, but because she cannot get a handful of rice, she's slowly sinking. Thanks in part to the fashion show you just saw, Tete and the woman of Kupahoka are now negotiating to design and create clothing for major retailers in Europe and Latin America. This extraordinary shawl is an example of the work they do. The idea of free enterprise is appealing, but it takes time. What do you do when you see starvation, poverty, and death gripping your nation, when people are literally dying on your doorstep? For Muhammad Yunus, the answer was simple. Start a bank. 
and make loans to the very poor, no collateral required. It was and still is a revolutionary idea. They couldn't believe that anybody in the right mind will do something like that. And that happiness, that excitement got me into it. I said, if you can do this kind of thing, which makes so many, so many people so happy, with such a small amount of money, why shouldn't you do more of it? Many people thought he was crazy, and many more in this male-dominated Muslim society were upset that Yunus wanted to loan money to women. The simplest reason is, if the mother is the income earner, children benefits right away. So this is one. The immediate attention to children, nutrition level increases, they get enrollment in the schools, and so on. And then women have longer vision. They wanted to get out of poverty much more intensively than men do. Men do it. <laughs>